two spe special cases that are commonly looked at uh, with the Routh array that have to do with uh, what happens when you get a zero in either the first column or you get a set of zeros in an entire row. We're going to look at uh, one example, and this is um, from the book. This is problem 3.33. And here, h of s is going to be the transfer function uh, whose uh, to some numerator over denominator, and the denominator is given as s to the fifth plus 3s to the fourth plus 2s to the third, plus 6s squared, plus 6s plus 9. So if we go ahead and formulate our Routh array, s squared, s to the 1, s to the 0, and we draw in our rows, and start drawing in our columns. We end up, uh, we have, again, we take the, the odd, the, the first, and then third, and fifth, and so on. So one, uh, two, and six, and then we have a zero. And then all the other elements, three, six, nine, zero. Now that the uh, top two rows are filled in, we can now start looking at, at the next uh, row. And here, B1, I end up with a zero. And uh, for the next element, I have a three and then I'm going to have a 0. And then for the s squared term, uh, what I have to do here is, since I have the 0, I can't divide by 0. So I assume, OK, well, let's just say that this isn't 0. Let's let it be epsilon, some very small value, and uh, which is approximately 0. And at this point, um, we're not going to make any assumptions about positive or negative uh, values here. And then if I keep going down and I start calculating out the rest of the the elements, I end up with uh, 3 times 2 epsilon minus 3 over epsilon. And for this element, uh, sorry, for here I get 9. And then down in the last row, I end up with, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to call it D1, and I'll write it over here. And then I have a 0. And then finally down here, I end up with uh, 9. And in this case, D1 ends up being, the, let's see, I have three, nine, sorry, nine minus nine epsilon squared over two epsilon minus three. And now what I do is I let epsilon go to zero, and I look for sign changes. Notice in this term, as epsilon goes to zero, uh, I can just take the limit of uh, 3 times 2 epsilon minus 3 over epsilon as epsilon goes to 0. And I can divide through. And notice what I end up with is that this term is going to negative infinity. Um, and because these guys cancel out, but I end up with a, a minus 3 over epsilon. Now, if we look at the term d1, I see the limit of 9 minus 9 epsilon squared over 2 epsilon minus 3 as epsilon goes to 0. And I can just go ahead and, and take that limit right away, and I get 0 over minus 3, uh, but, and that's at 0, and I end up with just 9. So now I go through and I start to count my sign changes. I go uh, 1, or sorry, positive, positive positive, it's you know, almost zero, but positive. Then when I get to here, this limit ended up being negative, went to negative infinity, so that's one sign change. So there's a sign change. And then when I go from s squared to s to the one, I go, that limit was nine, so that's negative to positive, so that's indeed a sign change. So it turns out that there are two sign changes. And we would say that that would be unstable. And if I go into MATLAB and, again, look at the, the, the actual poles, I would find that from MATLAB, we find that the, the, the poles are at minus 2.9, uh, 0 0.65, plus or minus j times 1.29, and uh, minus 
0 0.7 plus or minus j times 0 0.99. So indeed, we see that there are two poles on the left half, or in the right half of the complex plane. So the system would be unstable. Finally, we can use the Routh array to look at the idea of what we call parametric stability. So this is, um, again, out of FPE, and it's example, um, or sorry, it's um, problem 3.46 in the book. And if I have a, a transfer function uh, or a system, and I put this particular compensator in here, which is S plus Z over K times S plus P, we're going to look at what this is called a lead lag filter. And that feeds into a plant, which is given by K naught over S squared minus A squared. And there's unity feedback around this particular system. Uh, in the problem, he says this is a, a tape drive or a uh, just, uh, yeah, like for reading. Anyhow. <laughs> so if I find the closed loop, uh, transfer function, I end up with the following. I get k naught over k times s plus z, and then that's all over s to the third plus p times s squared plus k naught over k minus a squared, all of that times s, plus z times k naught over k minus a squared times p. And the question is, how do the, uh, what restrictions are there on p, k naught, k, a, and z so that the system is stable? Well, we can use the Ralph Hurwitz criterion to help us figure this out. And again, we can build our table. We have s to the third, s squared, s to the first, and then s to the zero. And the only thing hard about this problem is that I've got a lot of uh, parameters floating around that are not uh, constant numbers, they're, they're just variables. But otherwise, it's fairly straightforward. I have 1 k naught over k minus a squared. So that's that term and that term. And then there's going to be zeros out here. And then I have p and z over k uh, times k naught over k minus a squared times p and then zeros out here. So I need to calculate these. And we know from uh, our previous discussion, this term here is just going to be z times k naught over k minus a squared times p. So I just have to calculate this term right here. And that term turns out to be, after uh, a bit of work, k naught over k times 1 minus z over p. So the criterion, since this is a 1, what I need, then, is that P has to be greater than 0, B1 has to be greater than 0, and this guy has to be greater than 0. And B1 here is, is um, given by this, this term over here. I went ahead and made the assumptions, uh, just to make the uh, problem a little more tractable, that K naught, K, and A are all positive. So if we make that assumption, then we can uh, reduce our criterion down so that P has to be positive. We need 1 minus Z over P to be positive, and we need um, <clears throat> Z, uh, Z K naught over K minus A squared P has to be positive. So this term allows us to say that 1 has to be greater than Z over P, or in other words, P has to be greater than Z. And we can move this over and then divide through. And we end up with Z and then divide through by P. So Z over P has to be greater than K over K naught times A squared. So we can put both of those together. And we end up with 1 has to be greater than z over p has to be greater than k over k naught a squared. Or if I multiply through by uh, p, I end up with p has to be greater than z has to be greater than k over k naught 
a squared times p. So I have two inequalities that bound the value of z. And the next thing we can do is go ahead and make a plot. And these plots can be useful by looking at re for looking at regions of stability. So if I plot on a set of axes, I plot p versus z. This inequality is bounded by the line where p equals z. So that's just a line with slope 1. That's p equals z. And this other inequality is bounded by a line <clears throat> that has a slope k over k naught times a, a squared. And notice this k over k naught times a squared has to be less than 1 for this inequality to hold. So it's going to have a slope somewhere down here. So this is um, uh, z is equal to k over k naught a squared times p. And then I can look at the regions of stability for z less than p. I can't be in this area, so I can scratch all that out. And for z to be greater than k over k naught a squared times p, I can't be in this region, so I can scratch all that. So this is our stability region. And we can form um, these kinds of diagrams for all sorts of different parameters uh, for all sorts of different problems. So to summarize, again, the roth horowitz criterion is a way to look at stability given uh, the Roth array. And we can do simple examples uh, where we have the coefficients and we don't necessarily want to calculate the roots, although this is a fairly trivial thing to do now with MATLAB. There are special cases where we have to deal with uh, zeros in the first row or in entire columns. But the most, most useful thing of the Roth Horowitz array is to actually use the array to look at what we call parametric stability, which can bound uh, our gains in our control law so that we can make sure the system is stable. Notice down here we found this relationship between P and Z, and P and Z actually go into our compensator up here. So I, I know that um, this says that P has to be positive, so then both Z and P have to be positive, and then I have to be bounded by in this, uh, in this range for stability.